everybody should know about it, right? Because I think when, when we think about how this world works and, you know, this wasn't taught in civics, right? And I think a lot of us are still kind of learning how government works, how city hall works. Um, but it's a lot of money. I think you should know where your taxpayer dollars are going. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're not ready to get in government contracting right now, just to know that the opportunity exists for your kids, or there may be somebody else that may be into trade, start their own construction company. It's one thing to, to clean up or have a janitorial service. It may be one thing to clean up homes. It's another thing to get a contract to clean up all the eight Atlanta public schools. Oof. That's the difference, right? So when we think about DEI, a lot of times we focus on workforce, but I'm focused on contracting. So when you think about hiring, a black person, you're changing their family. And that's great. But when you give a contract to a black owned business, you're impacting that business, all of the people on salary and that community. So there's a lot more value or a lot more impact rather in contracting versus just workforce. And so I just want us to understand that we need to be in contracting and putting the pressure on contracting just as much as we're pressuring, we need to hire more black people in this position. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to the More Rounds Podcast. I'm Kim Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Chromix. And on this podcast, we talk about how to fund your business, whether that's raising money or venture capital or crowdfunding or through debt or through cash flow. And today, you guys, I have one of the OGs in the travel space here with me, even though she doesn't do travel anymore and she does business with the government, okay? But do y'all remember Can't Stay Put or Low Miller, right? Um, I've been watching her for almost like a decade now. Um, run businesses, travel the world, go to Iceland, inspire me and my first trip to Iceland. Uh, we met a decade ago. And I did like a blog for her back on my niche social network for natural hair. Like literally, like that's how long I've been following Lauren. So I'm so excited to have her on the podcast. But before we get started, we have to do a cheers. My okay. bad. My yeah. bad, girl. Here we go. Cheers. cheers. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lauren, tell the people about you, military consulting, and just like a, a brief like connection from Kent State put to where right, you are now. Right, okay, so today I currently run my father's business, military consulting with my brother. It's a second generation management consulting firm. We work primarily with the local, state, and federal government on procurement consulting and increasing supplier diversity. And so another way to kind of say that is we work to eliminate the barriers that exist for us to do business with the government. So all of our work is around wealth creation and creating more opportunities for black and women owned businesses to do business with the government. Um, but how I got into this space, my father came to me probably about, I guess it's been like seven years now and asked me to help him live as long as possible to get him me and my siblings ready for his departure. A part of that was learning the family business and becoming his like apprentice, if you will, learning family history, went through a whole like downloading succession process, if you will, the passing of the baton. And so for the last six years, me and my brother have been running the business successfully and the business is a year older than me. So it's 37, I'll be 36 in Ooh. October, so don't age me. Um, so we've been in business for 37 years. And since then I've just been leaning more into just the business of family, like introducing more people to government contracting, because I think a lot of people just don't even know or think about the government as a potential client. And that's the space that we're in. And we're reviewing numbers every single day and looking at what the government spends and who they spend it with. And it ain't with us. And we pay taxes. So I want more of us to get in the game. Girl, I was just on a previous episode uh, with Hope from Mary and Maine. I was telling her, I feel like black folks' reparations should be tax-free businesses for the first 10 years. Hello. Like, Hello. <laughs> we should not be paying the same taxes we built the country. Like Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then the thing is, even when we say we built this country, we built the most richest country. And I think we need Ooh. to add that to the descriptor, too. Not just any country, the number one capitalist country in the world. And we should be able to participate in every commercial system that exists in this country. Well, come on, speak okay. on it. Okay, if I could, if this was an audio, I'd be snapping, girl. Okay, um, tell the people, be more, so if, for example, you said that you help more business, black-owned businesses do business with the government. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Okay, so for us, our clients are cities, states, school districts, any government municipality, if you will. And so what governments do or they're mandated to do is something called a disparity study. And what that is in, is an assessment to see what the minority participation is in their government contracting. Because because we pay taxes, it should be a fair, equitable uh, procurement system, right? Okay. Because it's 
there's a governmental interest to be fair because we all pay taxes. Unlike the private sector, if they don't want to do business with black people, they ain't got to do business with black people. Mm. But in the public sector, because we all pay taxes, it should be fair. Right. But oftentimes it's not fair, right? We're, we know the world in which we live in. And so what happens is the government has to do something called a disparity study. And what that is, we come in and we look at what they're spending and with who and at what level, right? Mm. And so what's the delta between who exists in the marketplace and who you're actually spending with. So for example, we look at how much, say for the city of Atlanta, how much does the city of Atlanta spend on construction in five years? They may spend, I don't know, $500 million. Of that $500 million, how much of that is going to black owned businesses, women owned businesses? And is there any discrimination in that process to remedy anything, any ailments that are taking place? So for us, think of us as like, I don't want to call us an auditor, but we're here to make sure that governments are being fair and making sure there are no discriminatory practices. Because for us, it's like, like you said, we built this shit, right? And we pay taxes <laughs> on every damn thing, right? And so who is building your, who are building your schools? Who's paving the roads? When you look at those signs, oftentimes they're not black owned businesses, right? But the government spends billions of dollars every single year during a recession, during a, the good times, the depression, during all times. And so for me, it's like, Having a B to G model is paramount because mm. it's going. It ain't gonna slow up. B to G. We got B to B. We got B to C. B to G. Yeah. So you audit the government. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, in a sense, we audit the government. We, so you audit. You audit discrimination. Yeah, exactly. And so our history, if you will, like before my father started this company, he actually did that for the city of Atlanta. So my father worked for the first black mayor of Atlanta, Mayor Jackson. My father was the youngest and first black director of procurement. So growing up, he talked about how many millionaires he created in the city of Atlanta through government contracting. Mm. So when we think about Atlanta, like the Mecca and black entrepreneurship is very much entertainment today, but 20, 30 <laughs> years ago, it was very much black owned business. And a lot of that came from Maynard Jackson's administration. Um, so there's a little Atlanta history for you. So when, uh, when my father was at the city, he created the first minority business program in the country, which was later adopted by USDOT. Um, USDOT? Yes. That's United the States Department, Department of, of Transportation. Transportation. Okay, yes. okay. And so when my father was at the city of Atlanta, the participation at the airport represented 95% of participation in all government contracting. Wait a minute. I don't understand. What does that mean? So that means that the the vendors that were in the airport, so my father put the first black floors in the airport, the first black Popeyes in the airport, all of those black vendors that are in the airport, yeah. that participation represented 95% of the total U.S. minority participation in contracting. What? Meaning that Atlanta served as the hub for black owned business in, in contracting. Wow. And so Atlanta's kind of known as power. like the Mecca, right? When you think about black business, because we had the mayor that was like, I don't care. Delta's not going to come here unless y'all doing business with people that look like me. Mm. Hence why we have the biggest and the most, you know, busiest airport in the world. Right. So we can and blackest. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, I remember my first time coming to Atlanta. I was like, am I in Wakanda? I was listen, like, everybody is black. Like, yeah, the, the pilot is black. Everybody the, the is bla black. And that's the not by mistake. That's by design. You know what I mean? There's a lot of effort and a lot of people here, black business owners and leaders that put a lot of intention behind that. You know what I mean? And it's not something that happens overnight. People have been migrating to Atlanta for the last 40, 50 years. This is not a last 10 year, last five year type of thing. Watching on YouTube, unfortunately, is not enough. If you've learned anything from my podcast, please, please, please leave me a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I would be so appreciative and you would help further the progress of this podcast. Now back to the episode. But I wouldn't even think to be like, I'm going to audit you and you're going to pay me to audit you, mm -hmm. right? So, like, how did your dad even know that that was a thing that was available? And let me just, I wanted to mention it before I get to that part. The fact that your dad was able to pass on a business to you, black-owned businesses don't live longer than a few years. So, it'd be like, it's 37 years old. Mm -hmm. Most most kids aren't even willing to take on their parents' business because they just like, I don't want that. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I'm like, we're going to have to discuss that yeah. part of it. Like, the fact that you were even able to be like, all right. I'm going to put down what I'm doing and I'm going to do what my dad is doing because of X, Y, Z. I have questions about that. Yeah. Because so many of us are so proud and so like, Listen, this is, this I got a lot to say. You know? Okay. And, and everybody be like, oh, do your passion. I'm like, but your passion don't make no money. Like, okay. don't do your passion. But how did your dad even think to be like, I'm going to audit you and pay mm. and you got to pay me to do it? 
Well, listen, he was a bad motherfucker. Let's be clear because he, <laughs> so okay, like, Mr. he he created the disparity study industry. He did the very first disparity study in 1989. And Who so did he, he do it for? He did it for Hillsborough County in Florida. So Florida was kind of like the uh, pioneering ground, if you will. And so he predicted that the Supreme Court would mandate that you needed to do a legal predicate to put these minority business programs together. So a lot of you may know that like, whether it's in corporate contracting or government contracting, they may have, you know, 15% of every contract needs to go to a black owned business right. or 10% needs to go to a woman owned business. You can't just make up those percentages arbitrarily. Right. They have to be backed by some legal predicate. Oh. A disparity study is another word for a legal predicate. So we provide the legal basis to support whatever goals that an agency may have. Right. So mm. it says like Did the 15% pledge reach out to y'all. No, so that is, they haven't, right? But I am very aware, aware of what they're doing. And so the things legally, you can't just assign a percentage based on our demographic because that's not going to hold up in court. Oh. So just because we represent 13% or 14% of the U.S. doesn't mean that 14% of all contracts should go to us. It's based on how many businesses exist. So just because Atlanta may be 50% black, are, do we have 50% plumbers that are represented in the city of Atlanta. They may not exist. So we can't just say 50% of all plumbing contracts need to go to black people black people if black plumbers don't exist. Mm. It's not so it's like so part of this is more of us need to get into business to to be able to support whatever goals that are out here doing this work. And so I know it may sound very confusing. However, that's also by design too. Government yeah. <laughs> government contracted. There's a lot of bureaucracy. And there's a lot of people that don't play in that world just because of that. But it's also very discouraging or it should be encouraging because there's just a lot of money to be made. Right. How do you how does one go after that contract? Like, so do they come to you or are you looking for them? Like, I mean, I'm sure some people come yeah. to you, but like, how are you going after them? So essentially, most government contracts are uh, solicitation based. So they are. Uh, a RFP. So if you ever heard of like a request for proposal or RFQ, and so they are competitive bids. So each agency has a different threshold for what's competitive. Oftentimes, any contract over $50,000 is competitive, which means you have to put out an RFP. And so there are tons of services that aggregate opportunities that are released every single day. Okay. We happen to be subscribed to a company called Bid Prime. And so we pay for this service and every single day I get opportunities sent to my email every single day. And so mm. what you do on your profile is uh, identify what your NAIT codes are, another word for like what your company capabilities are. And so any opportunity that is flagged that comes in alignment with what you do, they'll send you opportunities every single day. So that's how I and kind of keep the pulse on what opportunities exist. But on the front end, I'm always constantly, you know, making relationships, meeting people, because I can also play a role in getting an agency to write an RFP for me by doing the pre-work, if that makes sense. Mm, okay. So, and, and are these RFPs or RFQs, are they like, 30 page documents or like, what does that look like? So you see opportunity comes through. Mm -hmm. You're like, Oh, okay, I think that we can fulfill mm -hmm. this. We can do this disparity mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find the agency to fulfill it. Is mm -hmm. that what you're doing? So here's an example. Submit an application that says like, yeah, what does it look like? Yeah. So I'll just walk you through, say like a uh, opportunity that we just pursued with, uh, let's see, like Durham County in North Carolina, Durham County decided, you know, they really want to increase minority participation in their contracting. They want to instill more goals around their contracting in order for them to do that. We need to do a disparity study. So they will write an RFP. They will publish it on the street. You have to make it public. Everything in government is public. Mm -hmm. So they have to publish it. And at that time when it's published, Bid Prime, who we are, we have a subscription to, Bid Prime picks that up, sends us a notification that says Durham County has just released the RFP to do a disparity study. At that time, I download the RFP. I work with my proposal team. We have an internal team that writes our proposals. And because we've been doing it for so long, like it's kind of like a copy and paste type of thing now. But you are, you know, putting together your coming capabilities, you know, your cost proposal, all of the various different things that you would put together in a normal proposal. You submit that proposal, they evaluate it, they may have like a interview process, and we go through an interview and they evaluate you and they select you, you win the contract, move on from there. So And this is a quick pay cycle typically? So I would say our sales cycle varies from, it can be as quick as three months to a year mm. because government is like when it is slow. 
Um, you know how long it takes to fill potholes. Just imagine how long it <laughs> takes to do anything else in government, right? Yeah. Um, and so it can be, you know, the thing about government, which can also make it very daunting, is is not universal. So how the city may do things may not be how the county does it, and it may not be how the state does it. There is no universal way about this, mm -hmm. which is another barrier to why people may not participate in this marketplace and can anybody get into it can i just decide i want to be yeah i mean you can yeah if you're in business you can decide now you may not win no contracts <laughs> now you, you like, can go you can go pursue you that good right you may yeah. pursue because let's let's be frank like it's not it's not free money right just like if you're in business it's it's you have to do your due diligence it's work um, and so oftentimes when people talk about government contracting, sometimes they position it as like, it's just free opportunities. Like they just cash out. <laughs> that's and how, that's what all the like internet yeah. entrepreneurs and like and, the folks on the podcast be saying. And like, it's not like that. Now you may have outliers. A lot of times, even in this space, in the media, a lot of people will amplify outlier situations. Right. And yes, there are people that can go get a contract in 30 days, but that's not the overwhelming majority. Right. Mm. It does take where oftentimes it takes, if you have no skin in the game, you've never done any contract work. I would say probably a year or two to mm -hmm. really like mm -hmm. learn one is learning how to do business and then actually putting together a strategy and then implementing it. I would say a year or two to give yourself time to like really get into it. And so sometimes it may be better for you to already have an established business model and then venture into building out your BDG model versus starting at B2G. B2G. I love that. I'm going to adopt that mindset B2G so I can make sure I'm getting some government money. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to you deciding to put down your passion mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. take on your dad's cape and his, and his mm -hmm. business and to pursue that mm -hmm. and keep that alive. What was that decision like? And like looking back on it, you know, are there any learnings or <laughs> what are some thoughts you have? Um, it was very hard. You know, I think oftentimes now we hear, you know, generational wealth, oftentimes they're from first generation people. I'm not first generation anything mm. um and so for me it's like how do you manage having this inherited responsibility with your own sets of dreams and aspirations right and it can Oof. be a very hard thing you know because a lot of people don't know what having inherited responsibility is Ooh, it's right? like arranged marriage to me okay <laughs> listen it's giving, it's giving a range right <laughs> um and so at first you know i'm out in the world you know building my brand and my business i'm very excited because this is i'm pioneering this space and at first I was just like, God, why is this happening right now? You know, like my dad is, you know, he was dying um, and needed my help. And I like it was hard. I was just like, I, ain't, I don't want to do this. You raised me to be an entrepreneur. I'm out here doing it. And now you're telling me to stop. Mm. This is not how it's supposed to go. And essentially he was like, you know, Lauren, secure this. This has been around for 30 plus years. Secure this. So this could be an ATM for you and your siblings and you can go back and do whatever it is that you want to do. And at the time, being hot headed, I was 26. I ain't want to hear that. I'm like, no, I want to do what I want to do. This is like, and you don't know what you don't know. I thought I do all about business. I ain't really know shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't we all, girl? You don't we all? I mean? Look, I'm going to so, cheers. And, and, <laughs> right. Okay. And so here I am trying to tell my dad stuff you know, it's just so crazy the audacity that you have when you're in your 20s and like you think you just know so much, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was very hard. And I think not until I really understood like my family's history, because a part of our process was like learning where I come from. And so also learning that like my family, like you mentioned, we have been farmers and landowners for over like 140 years. So Ooh. land and agriculture has been a part of our history. And so there's always been this inherited responsibility with every generation. And so although my father decided not to be a farmer, he actually used his business to, so USDA retained my father's company to do a study to see if there's discrimination in the farm agency granting uh, money to black farmers. That work led to a $4 billion settlement, which our farm was a recipient of. Ooh. So although my dad was not a farmer, his work still had a certain component of inherited responsibility to push our family's agenda forward, right? Yeah. So going through this process with my father started to help me understand that like, okay, Lauren, you have to put this travel stuff on hold, but if travel global citizenship is your thing, how can you use that to amplify your family's mission and amplify it forward? So, you know, it was hard because I would look into my right and, you know, 
everybody was advancing. You know what I mean? It was like, damn, I'm part of the, like the the like birth of this and other people are getting the accolades and the recognition for this. And I was on the ground floor, but I kind of had to like, what, what were people getting? What did you, you know, like just, I think just recognition or just like just the natural growth of the industry. Right. Cause when I started travel influencer was not a term influencer was not a term. What we were doing was not a career. Like when I was telling people I was traveling for a living with a photographer, people were like, what the fuck is that? Right. You know what I mean? Or and like, they think that you thought you was all into yourself. Right, exactly. Like why you, you have a right, photographer all the time right, with you? Exactly. So like and even- this is before reels and stories right, before and all that. Before reels, before stories, before all of these things. And so at that time, photographers would turn me down. <laughs> like, it's, and so it's so funny now because photographers would jump at the, at the opportunity to get a full paid opportunity to travel the world. But at that time it was like, I don't know what it is that you're doing. So to have to take a step back from that and then for that space to start to be more accepted and it start to get bigger and more more people are introduced to it, it was very hard. Because you're just like, what the fuck? Like, I had something to do with that. And <laughs> I'm not in the game no more. You know what I mean? Right. But, you know, I also realized that, like, you only get one dad. You know what I mean? Cool. Like, and for me, my father was my custodial parent. So, like, when my parents got divorced, my mom work for the Bill Clinton administration. So when she she moved from Atlanta to D.C., my parents started to ping pong me back and forth between Atlanta and D.C. So I started flying by myself at five years old, which is it's not a coincidence that I started Can't Stay Put as an adult because I literally have been traveling since I was a child. Yeah. But my father was my custodial parent. So me and my father, are like, when you think about the father, daughter, daddy, girl, like, we on steroids time 10. Oh. So when my father got sick, it was like, ugh, this fucking sucks. But it's like, this is my, you know what I mean? Like, this is, this is my person. And so it was very hard at the beginning, but after a while, it's like, no, this is what everybody's out here trying to build. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I've only worked for myself for family. That's a privilege. I've never had to code switch shit. You know what I mean? Like, the level of freedom that I walk in is because of the foundation that the people before me have laid. And so it was like, all right, Lauren, like, yeah, it's very bittersweet to like see your peers continue to grow and elevate in this space that you had a, a place in like starting. But this is this is legacy. This is some legacy shit, right? It's not going yeah. nowhere, right? Um, and so in hindsight, like now I am tapped to speak about succession planning. I get paid to like advise on the business of family. How do you go about doing this process? Like, how do you record your family history? Like, what is this like? Um, and so it's a blessing. And I'm so happy that I took up the mantle because now I have entrepreneur pursuits. But it's like now I didn't set this ATM up and it's going to be. Like, my bills are paid. Cash flow. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and it's just Cash like, <laughs> I am so happy that I listen because this is a 30 year business that's tried and true. You know what I mean? At the time, I think I was only in business maybe like two and a half, three years. So I was still a spring chicken. You know what I mean? Thinking that I had done a lot. I haven't really done too much. The number one question I get all the time is, Kim, is Curl Mix available in stores? We have been saying no to every retailer for the last seven years that I've been in business. And we are finally going to be on store shelves, you guys. We are going to be available in Ulta. And I really need you guys to show up and buy us out so that we can blow up in the store and do well. Thank you so much for watching our podcast. And please make sure you go buy Curl Mix, now available in Ulta. You, you know, know, you could have said no to your dad. I could have. And you didn't. I didn't. I did you Did you think about just saying, like, yes, I'm going to just say this while you, you know, but maybe mm -hmm. I'm going to do my own thing later. Like, it, it, were you, like, bought in, you know, or, like, like, because that's to me, you know, let me take a Please, sip. Uh, no, there was no, like, <laughs> so when many people ask me and my brother, like, I don't really think we had a choice. Like, for example, like, in... My grandfather was in the centerfold of Black Enterprise in 1980. And like the last sentence he said was like, if my sons ever sell this land, I will come back and haunt them. <laughs> so it's the same thing with my dad. I feel like if we ever like try to be like, we don't want to, like he would come <laughs> and like haunt <laughs> us. Now, I think what me and my brother are doing differently is, you know, we're owners and operators. I'm planning to get out of operating within the next year or so. And so for us, we don't necessarily want our kids to have to operate. We just want them to be owners. So putting together the board and all that kind of stuff. So there is a different mission for our generation. Um, and so it's interesting that, you know, your podcast is called More Rounds because my dad comes from an area like, you don't take nobody else's money. You own everything of everything because you don't want nobody to try to steal your shit. Mm. And so there have been times where I looked at some of my financials and like he had like some years, he had like an $8 million year. I'm like, dad, you could leverage that and got more capital. That just wasn't. That's not where he comes from. And I think 
me and my brother are like, shit, we have years like that. We're definitely leveraging. <laughs> We're definitely leveraging. We're I out of this. So, okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's different things that we plan to do, unlike our father. But, you know, it's also a privilege in which, like, my father also comes from an era where, like, people's trying to steal our land and steal so you don't give up any of your ownership because you also come from that time where people were very predatory. So, girl, why is this giving like Queen Sugar all day, bro? <laughs> all day, I'm like, I just no. I Queen mean, Sugar. ironically, it's she actually your did, she interviewed my family, the author of Queen Sugar. Like we, yeah, we all up in that. Oh wow! <laughs> Wait, she interviewed it for the show. So she interviewed a lot of black farmers for the, her first book, and our my uncle's one of those farmers. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was joking. <laughs> I was joking. Okay, Queen Sugar is that in show. It yeah. Like, oh, all the sins, bro. Yeah, so like during that, like I don't think we still, we may not still hold the title, but like back in the 80s and 90s, we were the largest black owned farm in the Southeast. We had over 2,000 acres in production. Oh my gosh. And they, did y'all, do y'all farm sugar? No, so we and are in Georgia, so it's not as moist as like Louisiana. We can grow, but we grow peanuts, cotton, corn, soybean. And your family still operating in land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we won't. It won't. And they tried. To, they tried to steal it from y'all. Yeah, I mean, over the years, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, USDA is can be very predatory. I mean, we have just been very blessed to just have the continuation of one of people in our family that wanted to farm because you also. Another part of this, too, is, you know, during the Great Migration, a lot of people left the South to go yes. to Detroit, Chicago, you Chicago, know, all of these Rockville, places. That's right. That's and so are, a lot yeah. of people left the farm because there's also like this negative connotation to farming because of slavery, although that we are the original farmers. However, because of the opportunities on the East Coast and the Midwest and just the negative connotation, a lot of people left farming and mm. looked down upon people that stayed. And here we are, 2023, people want to break, build their own neighborhood. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> on like, their own it's farm. It's a hipster thing to do right. now is to build your own like, garden and like, we, farm your own tomatoes. Exactly. And, and it's like that's a, what a lot of us came from. That's how my father was raised. And so we just come from an era of like, you know, my dad would say, you know, we've had to deal with white people in a way that most black people haven't because we've owned land. So you've had to deal with them a certain type of way. I mean, they've dealt with a lot of trauma. And sometimes it's things that they don't even feel comfortable telling us, the younger people, because it is very traumatic. And our farm is three hours south of Atlanta, very rural, ash, Georgia, <laughs> one light, you know what I mean? So you can only imagine, like, they were still having a black and white prom queen until like the early 2000s so that just wait kinda, a minute <laughs> so that just kind of gives you an idea of just this this place in which my family comes from but because we did own there was a level of insulation from all the things that was happening and so I think for me I understanding that that's what true ownership is is the freedom right and the insulation that you can have from your world and the powers that be outside of the insulation that you're able to build you know what I love about this song? To me, you represent... I'm looking at you and seeing the future of my children. Mm. Like, what free, what it means to be free and black. Mm -hmm. It means I can cuss and I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, like, you don't control my paycheck. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? I, I own my future. I own my money. I own my whatever. And so I can show up as my full self, mm -hmm. whether or not you like it. And it's a blessing. And that's all I want yes. for myself, for my kids, is to be like... Be who you want to be, and it don't matter because you got money in the bank. Exactly. Like and you, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, Un unapologetically who you are, and I think every black child deserves to walk in that space. Every one of us, every one of us. Okay. Oh my gosh, we got to wrap up. But I have so many questions, <laughs> girl. I have Queen Sugar questions. I have, I have um, <sighs> legacy questions. I, I have government contracting questions. I have. You know, are you going to pick back up and traveling questions? Mm -hmm. But I can't ask you all of those because we literally have a couple minutes left. So I am going to ask you, what's an unpopular opinion you have about doing business with the government? Unpopular. Mm. I don't know if it's unpopular. It just made it be unknown. Like, government contracting is where it's at. I don't know if it's unpopular. It's just... Should like, everybody do it? Um, Everybody should know about it. Right. Because I think when when we think about how this world works and, you know, this wasn't taught in civics. Right. And I think a lot of us are still kind of learning how government works, how City Hall works. Um, but it's a lot of money. I think you should know where your taxpayer dollars are going. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're not ready to get in government contracting right now, just to know that the opportunity exists for your kids or there may be somebody else that may be into trade, start their own construction company. It's one thing to to clean up or have a janitorial service. It may be one thing to clean up 
homes. It's another thing to get a contract to clean up all the Atlanta public schools. Oof. That's the difference, right? So when we think about DEI, a lot of times we focus on workforce, but I'm focused on contracting. So when you think about hiring a black person, you're changing their family. And that's great. But when you give a contract to a black owned business, you're impacting that business, all of the people on salary and that community. So there's a lot more value or a lot more impact rather in contracting versus just workforce. And so I just want us to understand that we need to be in contracting and putting the pressure on contracting just as much as we're pressuring. We need to hire more black people in this position. You may, okay, so now you may have another question. So if you find a black owned business, so say maybe clean up all the, you know, apartment buildings mm -hmm. or schools or whatever, like, does that stay with them? Or is it, and if they're doing a good job, it does stay with them? Mm -hmm. Or is it more so like, no, every year we have a new selection of businesses that do this So it thing. depends. So like, every contract depends. So some, some agencies may, it may be a five-year contract. Oh, wow. For So, like, I have a friend. And are um, you getting paid on that for oh, five yeah, years? Oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So, like, I have a friend who actually used to work for the city of Houston, went to college, had an esteemed job, and he learned about government contract. He was like, oh, bump this. I'm about to be the yard man. He started his own landscaping business. He was probably making, what, maybe 80K working for the city, and now he pulls in, like, three to five M's a year as the yard man, right? He has a landscaping business. So, he does landscape and demolition for the city of Houston. So, that just goes to show you that, one can be content with a job and there's nothing wrong with having a job, right? Yeah. But I just want us to understand the value of contracting, government contracting too. Because, because he's the middleman, right? He's not the one doing the yard cleaning. I mean, you know, the yard keeping. He's hiring other folks to do it and then taking 10, 15, 20% off the top. Exactly. So it's like you... So he may, could be bringing in half a million in like uh, income. Thank you. So it's like, for me, it's like I may not... My future goal is to get into acquiring government contracting companies. So it's like, I may not be in the construction. You may have the trade, but I went to business school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and you may be the best construction manager. You know, I do all of these things, but you may not have the business acumen to get into government contracting. Why don't we come together? And so that's why I want more and more people to know about this marketplace because it may not work for you as an individual, but it's the seed that should be planted in your mind where it's like, if you see opportunity that comes up or you see a, another person that may have a business or a job that the government does business with, they should get in. Girl, you better make me quit my job. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just you got kidding. a good job, girl. I got a good job. I'm going to keep my job. I'm going to keep my job. Yes. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Lauren, you have been incredible. Government contracting. Yes. Doing, I'm like, I'm just, I feel, I'm inspired. And Thank I'm like, you. let me, I didn't have something to learn. Um, Wow. Okay, I drank all of my sparkling. Well, let me go mine. Black Girl Magic. But... Thank you guys so much for tuning into the More Rounds podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next episode.